in this 2018. Um, my name is Joel Cohen, I'm an Associate Fellow of the Academy of Ideas, which organises this uh, large event on weekend. Um, and I think it's kind of appropriate for us to kick off this year's Battle of Ideas by asking the kind of central question of what is the power of words? And in particular, what weight do words hold in shaping our world? Because this session, the crisis of diplomacy in an era of Trump, um, will try and go beyond whether or not um, we like or loathe the contents of Trump's Twitter feed, but we'll try to explore the kind of broader impact the misplaced words can have on international life and the kind of wider world around us. So I think it's important for us to remind ourselves that um, in the offline world, we do face some fairly serious international challenges, um, that more palatable forms of diplomacy haven't always necessarily been able to tackle. How, for example, will we respond to uh, conflicts ongoing in Syria and Yemen and Ukraine um, how will we respond to the r rising influence of China uh, and trade imbalances that that creates? Um, how will we deal with Russian aggression? Um, how will we deal with other threats, threats to our security like terrorism? Um, and also, how do we deal with threats to the international status quo that have really shaped and framed the conduct of diplomacy um, in a fairly set way for um, 20 or 30 years since the collapse of the Cold War and that perhaps a kind of wave of populism is now seeking to question or challenge. Um, I don't know about you, but I often kind of read the newspapers and feel a bit of frustration with the lack of progress and lack of focus that international leaders bring to some of these issues. And so for us, this session is an opportunity for the public to try and kind of set the terms of the debate. And as you will have seen on some of the big banners around the festival, this is certainly a place where free speech is allowed. To start off our first session of the day, I'm joined by a, a fantastic lineup of speakers. Um, and I'm going to start kind of over in this corner. Um, this is uh, in no particular order to which I'll speak. Um, we have Dr. Sean Lang, who's a senior lecturer in history at Anglia Ruskin University and a firm favorite of battle audiences for many years. Um, we have Professor Bill DeRodi, who's the chair of international relations at the University of Bath and an authority on security and other international issues. We have Mary Dijewski, who's a former foreign correspondent and has been posted in Moscow and Paris, Washington, China, and others. Uh, she's also a writer and broadcaster and regularly uh, publishes in the UK for The Independent and The Guardian. Um, and sitting to my left, we have Khan Ross, who's a former diplomat himself, left the Foreign Office in 2004, and is author of The Leaderless Revolution, um, a book about how power is changing in the 21st century. So to come on to the kind of the format of today's panel, um, I'm going to start off up here with a few quick questions. We'll get a sense of what all of our speakers think, and I encourage them to be honest and open about their opinions and uh, to be forthright when they think things in society need defending. Um, and I similarly extend that advice to you, our audience, because I'm going to be coming out for questions um, as soon as possible so that uh, you guys can help shape and frame the discussion and uh, that we together can try and kind of reset the terms of debate about international issues. Um, so I'm going to kind of throw out my first question, which is, is there a crisis of diplomacy today? Do we live in undiplomatic times? And I'd like to ask Mary if she'd like to take that question first. Well, I'm, I hesitate to be the first to answer that question because I'm sitting here in this sort of panel um, and with Khan Ross in particular, who is super better qualified than me to answer it. Um, but from a sort of further distance, if you like, I would say that we're less in a crisis of diplomacy than we're in a big change of diplomacy that maybe traditional diplomacy where so much depended on sort of um, splitting definitions and very careful use of words that was sometimes extremely um, deceptive and designed to please both sides um, without actually having corresponding substance where it actually mattered, that maybe we're in a transition where we're looking at that that's reached really the end of the possibility, what's possible in that sort of technique. And what we've produced is the reaction, which is exemplified by Trump, but it's not just Trump, 
other people have followed his lead in maybe putting out a sort of more bargaining approach to diplomacy of saying, okay, my first bid is so-and-so, absolutely, totally direct. Um, and maybe the problem, the crisis for diplomacy is that um, we, or at least a lot of people, haven't yet learnt to interpret and read the new type of diplomacy. Hong, would you agree with that? I mean, Mary speaks a lot of sense. I wouldn't perhaps put it quite as starkly. Uh, I should add I run an organisation that advises various countries and political groups, democratic movements from Mali to Syria to um, the Western Sahara that are engaged in diplomacy in one kind or other, and we advise them on how to engage in diplomacy. And so we are at the UN, the EU, uh, the Human Rights Council in Geneva and various other places. And what one sees in these places is that diplomacy is continuing. Uh, diplomacy in its classic orthodox state-to-state -state sense of states talking to each other, unfortunately, mostly in secret, um, and arbitrating their differences and producing agreements about the nature of the world. Um, obviously, Trump is a major new factor in that. But even there, um, even at the UN, which Trump decried in his speech at the General Assembly this year, the US has remained engaged. Um, Nikki Haley, who of course resigned this week for obscure reasons, it's not quite clear why, was very engaged at the UN. She had uh, called for a review of all UN peacekeeping missions, which is actually a very good thing. And it would surprise many people, I think, to hear that the country that has been most committed to transparency at the UN Security Council, which is a, a, a very depressingly secretive body, I served there for four and a half years, uh, is the United States under Trump. Uh, the U.S. was president of the Security Council in September, and she uh, ordained, which the president can, that every single meeting of the Security Council should be in public, because she said, which is something I have said rather more humbly, that there is nothing that goes on in the U.N. Security Council that should not be public. And she decided that and decreed it, and as a result, all the Security Council deliberations of, of September were, were public. I think there is a deeper crisis, though, going on, which is about the, the system's failure to deal with problems, uh, whether it's climate change, um, economic volatility, uh, mass migration, things like that, these global tra uh, trans-border problems. Um, it has long been clear, long before Trump, that an intergovernmental system, which only deals with one layer of those who affect these problems, is inadequate to address these problems, climate change being the classic one. And that's a much deeper and longer term trend. Sean, I wonder if uh, there are there is a historical line that we might look at in terms of international diplomacy um, and whether or not there is a kind of genuine break being discussed by our other panelists compared to that. When you talk about a crisis or change, of course the assumption is always that things were fine and hunky-dory and worked very well in the past. And I suppose as a historian, when you, when you always put things in a time perspective, you're very aware that what can look like calm, uh, collected, sensible, level-headed diplomacy by very polite people um, led, for example, to the First World War. Um, so it doesn't necessarily follow that the style in itself um, represents a, a crisis in the sense of being radically different from what went before. I suppose it's different in the case of Trump from Obama. Um, and it's in that sort of very short, short term uh, difference that one sees it most, most markedly. But I suppose, uh, again, this isn't new, but it is a factor that needs to be brought in here, is that it, there's such an emphasis on the one man at the top. Um, now, that's not new, and there have always been uh, figures in the past who've sort of thought that they and they alone are the ones who can negotiate, who've got the sort of business sense or the political sense or a mixture of the two to get where the system hasn't. And Trump is simply the latest in a long line of those. Um, so what, what I'm saying, really, is that historically he's not as different as we might think. That doesn't necessarily, of course, mean that he's easy to deal with. And some of the examples I have in mind, like the uh, First World War, are not particularly encouraging precedents. Um, but if you're sort of saying, is, is it totally new? I think Khan's point about the sort of behind-the-scenes diplomacy always going on is absolutely right, as indeed it has, always has done and has to. Because um, in, even when countries are at war with each other, you often find when you look into it that there's quite a lot of backstage dealing going on because you, you, know, you, you just have to. So um, I'm, without in any way reducing um, the, the sort of alarm factor, all I would say is that when you put him in perspective, he is depressingly familiar. Um, Bill, 
Um, well, I think Brits have always liked to dislike Americans, so I think we need to be slightly careful because we have our own security ministers and others who tell the Russians to go away and shut up or that the UK is coming to get you. So I do think it's a sign of the times. Trump may be the, you know, the flower on the top of the dung heap, but you know, it's the times that we need to understand and what's changed. Um, I'm completely with Khan for open diplomacy, and uh, you know, which I think dates from 100 years ago, Woodrow's 14-point speech, wasn't it? Um, to make these things transparent to the public. Um, and doing less behind closed doors because I think ultimately diplomacy has never been about us. You know, it's been something that elites used to do behind closed doors and now it's been turned into a public performance and the public performance gives it the veneer of reaching out to us and trying to engage us but it's really not about that at all. It's about virtue signaling um, and displaying one's moral values and I think just to finish on that point, I think the key change really to be boring was the end of the Cold War because that transformed the world from a political conflict between left and right towards one where people sought increasingly to display their moral worth. And the problem with that is that there's no accounting for taste. Um, you know, and we tend to categorize people very quickly nowadays, we assume lots of baggage. You know, if somebody says, I voted Trump or I voted for Brexit, you presume lots of other things go along with that that you should not necessarily presume. People voted Trump who had voted for Obama, not just once, but twice. Um, people vote for Brexit. They may have very similar views as those who voted for Remain on other aspects of, of political life. And I think we tend to tribalize too quickly nowadays in the kind of good heart uh, kind of you know, anywhere, somewheres kind of way. And I think that's very unfortunate. And there's, so there's this kind of veneer of moral signaling that doesn't amount to a lot. Mary, to come back to you, I mean, you started to suggest that there was a break in your first contribution, and we've heard from other panelists. Um, do you think that the kind of social media virtue signaling or um, part of the way that Trump and other leaders try and present their moral worth in, pub, in international life is helping us as a kind of diplomatic convention today? Well, um, I think that it helps to bring um, some of what has always been conducted in private to make it more public. And I agree with the, um, the UN Security Council. You know, those things ought to be public. You know, as in the UK, court proceedings ought to be public, always. Um, and they ought to be available to everybody. So I think that that's actually a good thing. And I don't think it's in any way incompatible um, with sort of Trump's other pronouncements or his, his general attitude. Um, because it seems to me he's taking a very realistic view of the UN that Every country has its own national interest, and that's what comes first. Um, and I think, he, in a way, he's turned away from the idea of sort of multilateralism and altruism as being sort of um, noble components of foreign policy and is actually saying it how it is, which is one way that the UN could actually be made to work better. Obviously, social, me social media has changed things. I don't think it's changed the substance. It's changed the methods, and it's changed the um, accessibility um, of information. It's democratized um, a lot of things. Um, but I slightly um, balked to hear um, a combination of Trump and virtue signaling um, or um, putting about his sort of um, ethical high ground. Um, I don't actually associate that with Trump at all. Tom? I think it's very difficult to separate diplomacy from other trends going on in the world. And one trend I passionately believe in is the crisis of late capitalism, that it's not working for most people. And as a result, representative democracy is not working for, because representative democracy or allegedly representative democracy in places like America has become profoundly corrupt. It does not represent the true interests of the people. And there are two basic responses to that. One is the authoritarian populist right wing approach to gather power to the state, to assert the power of one man speaking for the people. The other is a more participatory, bottom-up approach, which, of course, I passionately believe in. And these two trends are, to an extent, 
playing out in diplomacy. Trump represents a reversion to a Westphalian state-based model of producing order. That isn't going to work. It does not work. States do not produce order partly because they are so violent and their methods for producing order mm. are so ineffective in, in, a, in a globalized world where our problems transcend borders. So I think it's incumbent on all of us to really get clear about that distinction and work for the more, more participatory, open, transparent approach including in forums like diplomacy, but not only in forums like diplomacy. Can I push you a bit then? So um, you know, having been a diplomat, what is the space for the more private, closed off, hard diplomacy, backroom diplomacy that might have been a more typical thing of the past than you'd hope to see in the future? But you know, when Trump goes in to have a two hour meeting in closed doors mm -hmm. with Putin and we don't hear anything about it, what do you think those that kind of interaction with um, other leaders will always play a part in international life? Do you think it's necessary? Um, I, d I don't think it's necessary because I don't believe in states sorting out the world. I really don't. And I don't believe in the big man sitting in private with another big man sorting out our problems. I really strongly don't believe that. I despise it. Um, but it's still actually the predominant paradigm of diplomacy for all the talk of transparency and the change in diplomacy at panels like this. What I see is that 95% of it is still practiced in much the way it's always been practiced at these forums. You know, you look at the EU, where does Brexit come from? The EU Council of Ministers, the way decisions were taken over Greece's uh, profound currency and economic problems. These were profoundly untransparent things. Uh, Yanis Varoufakis has talked about this. This is not right. And we've got to chip away at this. Whatever we think of the Trumps and all the rest of it, we've got to keep our eye on that ball and work for these institutions that allegedly act in our name to be much more open. Um, to then ask a kind of broad open question to our panel for anyone who wants to take it up. I mean, is it harder today to make or to know how one makes friends or enemies in international life? Because the conventions of international diplomacy in the past don't necessarily seem to be serving what we want in the future or some of the challenges we'd like to take on. Sean? <laughs> we asked big questions. I thought you were going to give me that one. Um, well, I was, I was really actually just thinking through some of the implications of what we've just been hearing uh, just before I address that one. Yeah. Um, the, the point about Twitter is... It's, it's an interesting um, new phenomenon. It's very different from other forms of social media like, like Facebook. Um, a, because of the number of people it reaches, and secondly, because it, <coughs> it promotes fire. Um, it promotes a lot of argument. I wouldn't say it, it promotes discussion exactly. It's, you know, these things tend to be very blunt. And um, in a sense, what Trump is doing is perverting something which ought to be done, and indeed, I think follows on from what Khan's just been saying, which is to, which is to engage the public in your diplomacy. Um, the whole idea of open diplomacy, as indeed, as Bill said, um, which was promoted by Woodrow Wilson after the First World War, the point being that this closed-door diplomacy had been so fatal before 1914 and had helped produce 1914. The whole idea was that this would now be open, uh, you'd have agreements openly discussed and arrived at, and so on and so forth. There's a massive irony, A, first of all, because it came out of the most pe uh, closed piece of diplomacy I can think of, which is the formation of the Treaty of Versailles, in which the Germans were not actually involved. Secondly, and this is perhaps the crucial point, is that the idea was to get the American people behind this, and of course it failed, and the Treaty of Versailles was rejected. As a result, the United States were not in the League of Nations. As a result, the League of Nations never really operated in the way that the United Nations has managed to. So the ideal of open diplomacy and getting a sort of diplomatic foreign policy, I think, is an absolutely right, but it's extremely difficult to do. And what Trump is doing, it seems to me, is sort of taking the idea and perverting it, i.e. to whip up a Twitter storm with very, very populist um, ideas, phrases, words, we can talk about that, you know, which, which will get people's emotions engaged, because that's really what Twitter does, rather than, a, rather than an actual reasoned public debate and discourse. We saw, of course, much the same sort of thing in the Brexit uh, referendum here. And, and it, so, so it seems to me what we haven't got, but ought to have, is not so much the public um, diplomacy just like that, because that's what Trump gives us in a sense, but rather the public accountability of diplomacy. That's what we're not getting. There's, a, there's an important distinction between the two.
agree. That doesn't answer your question, but it does answer the one before. I agree. Um, Bill? I don't know if it's harder to make friends. The, um, I mean, obviously, the thing about the Cold War was that it worked to hold the right together because of their fear or hatred of the left. Um, and once the left had gone, the right woke up to realize that actually they didn't have that much in common anyway. You know, that bishops don't think the same way necessarily as the landed aristocracy or Nouveau Riche or Bill Gates. And so you have many different versions of the right. And that's why the post-Cold War period is marked by a considerable degree of uncertainty, um, scrambling for the so-called center ground. Obviously, there's a veneer of friends today. So Trump appears to cozy up in some parts to Putin because he sees in him presumably a degree of conservative, national interest-supporting authority figure. Um, and you could say so new friendships are being created around values rather than political outlooks. But you need to be careful. I mean, obviously, the classic trope currently is that there's this massive populist tide across Europe and across the world. And populism, in my book, is simply used as a pejorative term. No, none of these parties calls themselves populist. Many of them would not recognize themselves as being that term, and they come from right across the political spectrum. So there's no, there is no necessary presumption that these people will be friends and act together. The very final point, again, now is that what appears external in many instances is really appealing to internal audiences, and that's a key confusion. So. Um, even under Obama, he would accuse, for instance, Putin of being a homophobe in the run-up to the uh, Sochi Olympics. Um, and, but that was equally to try and uh, attack his audience back home in the kind of flyover states and in the Tea Party. Um, and so you know, he used that in order to make a point at home. Trump does the same. He says Russia didn't meddle in the election. That's to shut up dissent at home. And of course, Putin plays the same game. He says that the West is becoming degenerate and doesn't know anything about its own interests yeah. or, or, uh, anymore. And that's also to occur here as the domestic audience. So what we find, actually, is I, I think a, a period in which the real problem is at home for most of these nations. Um, and that's what needs to be addressed um, first. I'm going to come to Mary, because I know she has some... <laughs> Things to raise. I just wanted to endorse that point that very often either we misread things that foreign leaders say um, or because we don't understand that they're playing to a domestic audience. Um, but also, I think new leaders, especially, and George W. Bush was an absolute classic, don't understand the extent to which when they speak, they're speaking to a global audience, not to the domestic audience alone. And they don't understand necessarily how their words go down. Second point I'd like to make is just um, connection with um, something that Khan was saying, but what, what, what he does, um, among other things, sort of um, initiating um, countries which don't have a voice or don't know how to use their voice into making, uh, helping them be heard. Um, and I think one of the things about traditional diplomacy was that it was a very sort of set way of doing things that you were initiated into or not. And there were a lot of countries that actually weren't initiated into it, which put them at a colossal disadvantage. And I think maybe we don't appreciate on the other side how many countries um, don't actually know how certain things work. And I would put at the top of that list, I would put North Korea, that there were, over the last 10, 20 years, there have been signals that it was trying desperately to put out, to reach out, um, and yet nobody actually understood that um, because it didn't know how to go about it. Um, and maybe, I, mean, I think Bill Clinton first half understood that, and Trump understood it a bit better. Mary naturally speaks my language. Um, that's what I do, is bringing uh, groups and countries into diplomacy that otherwise excludes them. And of course, the major category of groups and peoples, representative, democratic, who are excluded from state-to-state -state diplomacy are non-states, are people who are not states. And yet, uh, non-state groups are becoming more and more important in all kinds of arenas, including climate change, 
where corporations, NGOs, cities, which are not states, are becoming very important, have long been very important actors. At the UN Security Council, 80% of the agenda of the Security Council, which is, was designed as a body to arbitrate state-to-state -state conflict, 80% of the agenda of the conflicts on its agenda involve non-state groups, are in fact primarily internal conflicts within states, intra-states. So the likes of uh, separatist Tuareg groups in northern Mali or southern uh, uh, groups in southern Yemen are in fact determinative for the future of those places and yet have no platform, have no hearing. And that to me has to change. I would also make one comment about social media. There is a, again a tendency in the sort of our general hand wringing about the awfulness of the world to believe that social media is basically a bad thing, that it gives a platform to populists and to the Trumps. We have found in our work that social media has been immensely powerful at giving a voice to those who won't get op-eds in the New York Times, don't get called by the BBC to comment on Newsnight. Uh, a good example of the Rohingya, for instance, uh, 900,000 Rohingya refugees sitting on the border of, with Bangladesh. Um, we got Rohingya groups inside these camps to speak directly to the British Foreign Secretary when he tweeted from Nyapidor, the capital of uh, Myanmar, that he wanted to talk about the Rohingya. So we got people to send video FaceTime messages to Jeremy Hunt, which he then responded to uh, 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 as a way of directly connecting these most marginalized voices. Uh, you know, it's hard to imagine a more marginalized people than those godforsaken people to people making decisions and who were about to see the Myanmar government. We've heard a very interesting argument put forward about the importance of bottom-up open democracy, particularly the last comment. But here's my question. For democracy, for diplomacy, what is the role of leaders and leadership? As, you, as we were learning about, democ about diplomacy, certainly 10 or so years ago, there was sort of this idea of moving from the state as the major actor to... Some, some level of supranationalism, and now it seems like the conversation is around this, this, this idea of, of, of bottom-up. And I just wanted to question whether or not the diplomacy in the era of Trump, is it, are, we, are we getting further towards that, or are we really moving back to a more um, perhaps tribalistic or more divisive um, level where, uh, where, it's sort of, where it's actually more uh, state or even driven by, uh, by individuals? Just to follow up on something that <coughs> distinction Sean made between kind of public diplomacy and accountable diplomacy, because it's not necessarily the case that closed-door diplomacy is not accountable, and it's not always the case that public diplomacy is accountable. And I'm kind of thinking, <coughs> trying to think through this, and I kind of, the, the question is, I, what the panel think of the rise of the celebrity diplomat? Because that's been a marked trend, certainly the last 20 or 30 years, where there seems to be an outsourcing to the cultural sphere of diplomacy, which is, as far as I'm aware, Bono and George Clooney are not accountable to anybody, no. um, whereas Trump possibly may still be. Um, coming back to Bill's point about the um, post-1991 1991 to 2016, values-based, virtue-based, um, from a realist's point of view, delusional <coughs> post-Westphalian model, has has that period actually seen a decline in the quality of the knowledge base that diplomats have? Because if you have a beliefs-based system, you actually don't need to know very much about your interlocutors. Uh, whereas if you have a realist system, you actually have to know something about the people that you are talking to. And I ask that question in the, in, in, in the context of a lot of um, foreign policy bloops, one after another in the post-91 period, that seemed to have been based on us simply not knowing enough or the right stuff about the people we were dealing with. Whilst we can all sympathize with the importance of non-state groups and actors, and we understand how and why that's come about, obviously we need to be careful because terrorists are also non-state groups and actors, and I presume you're not engaging those in diplomatic efforts, or oh, you may be. Um, the, I think it's it's very attractive, it's very beguiling, because we live in an age when nationalism is discredited, the nation state is seen as the source and root of all evil, and as somebody pointed out, I think it was the chap who asked the question, we've moved from the state being the central point of um, kind of international affairs and security towards the individual, and particularly the individuals 
insecurities. And in that regard, you can understand there was a shift towards supranational institutions, such as the UN and the EU and others, or subnational institutions, but not so much the nation. But the problem with all of those is that they're not accountable to you. Like it or not, the only people you can hold to account are your elected politicians. You might not like them, but you can hold them to account. Um, and of course, for all the chaff about non-state actors, they always ultimately look to states to implement what it is that they don't like. So you know, if, if you're Greenpeace, ultimately you look to the, a government to, to introduce laws to, to pursue things. And I think in that regard, it exemplifies one of the points I made earlier, that you, you see what, what you have is an elite that's become alienated from its own nation. It prefers to hang out in international clubs and mm. with people that it you know, shares cultural affinities to, um, but at the same time you know, adopts these new cultural values. I think it's the kind of worst of both worlds because you, you have a decline in any sense of the interests of the nation state on top of which is layered in all these presumed cultural values. And to finish the question that was asked directly to me about the knowledge of diplomacy, I do think that's true. And I think, you know, Mary and I were having a bit of a chat on the, up here before we started about the decline and demise of foreign languages in this country, which you'd have thought would be one of the roots of good diplomacy. Um, but I think apart from those factors, you know, an understanding of history as well, I think, is pretty essential. Um, to, to have any cultural affinities. But I think what we've done is we've moved from a period of uh, possibly excessive confidence about our, ourselves, our motives, and who we are, and how, what we're going to achieve in the world, to one of unnecessary uncertainty. And then you just have to decide, well, which do you prefer to be on the receiving end of, the excessively confident people or the unnecessarily insecure and uncertain? There's probably not a good answer to that, but, but um, I suspect there might be. Khan, I think, might have one. Well, definitely the and latter, a of lot course. Terms, I mean, I hate people asserting that they know what's best for us. Um, partly because I don't believe in the accountability of <coughs> made in diplomatic systems. I was uh, Britain's Iraq WMD expert on the UN Security Council. Um, our government has not been held accountable for the most grotesque uh, crime and error of British foreign policy in the last you know, several decades. There's been no accountability. Don't tell me that the Chilcot report is accountability. Blair still walks the planet giving high-paid speeches being put on the BBC. Do me a favour about accountability. Um, so we need to look at more accountable systems, and I agree with the point that transparency isn't ipso facto accountability. I don't think anybody's pretending that. There was a couple of very important points in the just made leadership the importance of leadership nobody's denying the importance of example the importance of people who can chart our way but i find it very striking considering leadership that the people we most venerate as leaders never had coercive power people like mahatma gandhi martin luther king nelson mandela um it is coercive power that i oppose not leadership per se it is the power of one person to tell uh, somebody else what to do and that brings me to celebrity diplomacy, an odious phenomenon that I despise. Um, it only gives me cynical amusement to see that Bono hasn't mentioned Myanmar after doing concert tours with celebrating Aung San Suu Kyi on a huge banner behind his head. Um, this, is, to me, is the epitome of unaccountable diplomacy. I have a long story about George Clooney's um, unhelpful involvement in South Sudan, North Sudan diplomacy, reception later. which <laughs> I can share with anybody later. Mm -hmm. uh, um, can I, uh, Sean, yeah. there was a question specifically on the tension you brought out about public diplomacy and accountable diplomacy that I'm eager to see. Well, I, I think I can actually link three of the questions because the question about leaders and leadership, and obviously this accountability one, this issue is one we've, be, we've been talking about. <clears throat> um, what worries me, um, about leadership is when you, th you have someone who thinks that they and they alone um, can solve it. And we've mentioned that Trump obviously has this. The one I have in mind, it's a very worrying precedent, is the Kaiser Wilhelm II, a similar sort of very childish, <coughs> rather, pe rather petulant approach, but sort of thinking that he and he alone could do it. Another one with enormous self-confidence, who really felt that the Foreign Office was, was useless, that he could deal with people man-to-man, -man, one to one was Neville Chamberlain. Um, and that, of course, is why he flies to, to Germany three times to, to deal with Hitler man to man. He gets that piece of paper, which, which he's so proud 
a sign. Now this, here we've got people who, in a sense, either because constitutionally they don't have to worry, as Trump, in a sense, doesn't have to worry directly in, for, for four years at a time. If you're the Kaiser, you don't have to worry at all. Chamberlain, even Chamberlain as a British prime minister, in a sense, felt he didn't have to worry about the weight of public opinion. And it's that sort of, I, I take Khan's point that accountability has massive limitations. Um, and the Iraq one, because you mentioned about uh, how much knowledge the diplomats have, what has always haunted me about the invasion of Iraq was Tony Blair's comment at the time that never has there been a time when the knowledge of history is of less importance in, um, in, in international affairs. I thought if he had known the history of British involvement in Iraq, Mesopotamia as it was, probably didn't. And I don't blame people if you don't. It's not very widely known. Um, but it's, it began with bombing in the 1920s. Funnily enough, the Iraqis hadn't forgotten it um, you know, um, 100 years or so later. So it's that sort of untrammeled um, confidence and, and power given to a leader so that they can follow effectively their own, not just confidence, but their own arrogance um, and the idea that they don't really need the experts. Again, you had that at the, uh, the Paris Peace Conference 100 years ago um, because there was a huge amount of knowledge compiled by the Foreign Office in the form of books. You can get them out at the Imperial War Museum. Massive amount of guidance which was there. They ignored it. They felt we don't need that. We can sort it out with disastrous consequences. Their police settlement lasted um, no more than 20 years. <coughs> and so much of this is because there's this sort of idea that I can do it because I have a sort of insight that no one before me has had. Leave it to me. And I point at, uh, you know, we can get away from him, can, can we? The point about Trump, of course, is that he's very proud of being the businessman. And it's this business model of, if I, you just get me down with the, opponent, with the opposing guy, um, the two of us can sort it. I'm not answerable to anyone, as you aren't in a business context. And of course, he made his name as a celebrity, known as celebrity diplomacy, on the American version of The Apprentice, where, of course, the tagline is, you're fired, which is fine in a piece of reality TV. It's not a way to do diplomacy. So um, going, you know, the, I, it seems to me that the answer on leadership um, is that you need that you need the sort of leadership, yes, of course, but which, first of all, listens. You've got to have people who listen, who are, can, certainly can have the confidence of their own judgment, but who take others on board and don't try to, don't shut themselves away and think only they can do it. I've seen so many examples of leaders in the past who've taken that line yeah. and it's led to disaster. I would absolutely endorse everything that um, has been said about celebrity diplomacy. Um, but I think there's a distinction between Trump um, as a businessman, as, uh, as a celebrity, because he is actually elected. Now, you know, we may not like that, but he was elected under the system that the US has. He has a mandate, um, which is not what um, celebrities have. Um, in terms of decline of expertise, I think it's almost worse than, than, than has been presented. Um, just looking at it from a parochial perspective, um, well before Iraq, the British Foreign Office changed its policy on its research departments. And instead of organizing it according to area with area specialists, it reorganized it under themes such as terrorism, climate change, and whatever. Um, and you can understand that there may be an argument for that. But the result was that a lot of people with area expertise left or had nothing to do that was in their, in, in their prime area of knowledge. And I think, indeed, that one of the results of that is that there were precious few people in the Foreign Office able to say, look, they're not going to welcome us with open arms if we start bombing them, whatever our favourite um, emigre representatives of the opposition may say. Um, and one of the most catastrophic things um, over the long term, I think, has been relations with Russia. Because I think what has been lost is an ability to try and see things from the other side, which is what, as I understand it, British diplomacy prided itself on for decades. And yet, over the last 20 years, especially in relation to Russia, it's been totally incapable of doing that. And I think that's one of the reasons why relations with Russia are so uniquely bad. Um, the third thing I wanted to say was about sort of multilateralism, supernaturalism, and whatever. And I think probably the, the, the era for that is indeed coming to an end, whether it's, um, whether it's going to be permanent or whether it's going to be temporary, I don't know. But where I came in, if you like, was, was on the, um, what some people would call interference in other people's internal affairs. 
Um, and one of the first examples of that was, you could argue, the Helsinki Final Act, um, which was about how other countries treated um, information and um, how it regarded... Dis it, it gave, um, it, as it were, enshrined in international diplomacy the right of um, other people to intervene. Um, and the that was taken to its ultimate level in the concept of responsibility to protect, um, uh, which arguably um, was one of the considerations behind the invasion of Iraq, um, but also Kosovo, Bosnia, etc. Um, I think that is actually quite a dangerous, um, you know, I know there's lots of people who advocate responsibility to protect. Um, I think it's a very, very dangerous concept, um, and I'm actually quite pleased to see it go. Lot um, today about um, Trump, and I'm just wondering for your opinion. You said about him being at the top of his tree in terms of his power. He's the president of the US. He doesn't have to wait for a few years until that might be troubled. Um, what about someone like Boris Johnson, whose lack of diplomatic language really disturbs me? He obviously had the position of uh, foreign secretary, uh, which he's no longer obviously in that office. Um, you know, why, why does he? Why does he particularly speak so? rudely so undiplomatically when he's not at the top of his tree? How does that figure? Hmm. I'm a little bit concerned about that, mate. Relatively simple question. Are Trump's Twitters spontaneous or are they carefully thought out, deliberated on? And the supplementary brief one is who actually writes them? Is it him, his office, or is it some other State Department, for example? I just want to continue uh, Mary's point about the, the Foreign Office. It's not just the organization, the reorganisation of the Foreign Office, it's the reorganisation of DFID. And then in turn, um, those institutes, like the Overseas Development Institute, which reorganises around the priorities of DFID, of the Foreign Office. Again, it's the British Academy uh, uh, or the um, uh, other research institutes that have their thematic... Uh, 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 priorities and, and so on. So it's systematic across all of our institutions about how we um, uh, understand the world. And just to give you a recent example, the BBC, for example, in its reporting on the recent Bosnian elections, does not understand Bosnia and is not even doing the basic homework of reading what is being said in the Bosnian press. You can't understand the world in English uh, and especially if those who should be mediators of our understanding of the world, all our institutions, don't understand the world themselves. I'm intrigued by um, Bill's notion of, is it worse to be uh, have somebody who is terribly nervous interfering in your internal affairs or somebody who's overconfident? Because it sort of relates to a, a different question, which is... Um, we, you're all, and we are all talking about we and our... And I'm always uh, come back to something that Tonto and the Lone Ranger used to say, which is, who is this we? You know, uh, because oh, yeah. it seems to me that the only time that we really have any influence on uh, diplomatic events is uh, something like the Arab Spring. Other than that, um, Khan's points about, you know, bringing in non-state groups, I, I kind of I see where you're coming from to a certain extent, but there seems to me a, a really fundamental mistake to uh, assume that anything that happens in diplomacy is about us. Yeah, so um, I was going to say that we spoke about accountability and such, and we spoke about um, celebrity diplomats, and kind of, I wouldn't say generalizing, but speaking broadly about those those subjects. But to me, i seen a lot on, on Twitter or stuff about um, how Trump would eventually succumb to his office, to the importance of the office of the President of the United States. But to me, um, and I think plainly to a lot of people, that that hasn't happened. And so really I think it's actually about the personality of whoever is running for office or whoever is in that position. And I think that's important with a lot of other politicians, not really just they're symptomat symptomatic of, of the systems that they, they come from, um, but really it's them. But my question really is that I'm actually worried, spoke about accountability and such, but I'm worried about the architecture we've had post-war, we spoke about status quo in the beginning, about how we have NATO and such, and how Trump has often used his position to lambast uh, these uh, these uh, structures. But where do you see, um, instead of just damage control, where do you see these structures and these agencies uh, taking shape and actually being able to sustain the future uh, under uh, figures such as Donald Trump? So we've had a very um, erudite and, and fascinating, and thank you for that discussion, 
thus far around all the problems we're encountering in diplomacy, um, whether it's celebrity diplomacy or lack of accountability. I'm interested in the panel's views on which direction we travel to begin to address some of those problems, and in particular, whether that's at the level, uh, the supranational level, or at the level of the nation state, or at the individual level, because it feels like some of the issues of both accountability and transparency, it feels like some of the comments from the panel are heading back towards the nation state, which I thought was quite interesting. To be positive, actually, I do see emerging some, in some areas, some positive things in um, diplomacy. Uh, the climate change pro process, for instance, that um, the Paris Agreement is a state-to-state -state agreement, but it has subsequently, and to an extent previously, expanded to embrace other groups who are uh, important in climate change. Governor Brown just did a big summit in California about, in the US, the state level, the US state level, which also engaged cities, big multinationals, as well as environmental groups and vulnerable states, like one of the ones I work with, which is the Marshall Islands, in an area I'm looking at, which is autonomous weapon systems, which is killer robots, if you like. Um, the involvement of AI companies in understanding that problem, let alone solving it, is absolutely crucial. Uh, there is no way that the knowledge exists within governments. And in fact, I feel that AI companies like the DeepMind are much more alert to the dangers of killer robots and autonomous weapon systems than in fact governments are. So in fact, all, all power to them in telling us about their, that problem. Uh, Elon Musk has been saying similar things. But um, I think this touches on the sustainability of these institutions. You know, if, if they become more heterogeneous, um, diverse, inclusive, it doesn't mean the end of the nation state. It just means the, the nation state becomes one actor amongst many, which to me actually act accurately reflect, re reflects the nature of power in the world, that we have a theory of change that you can only really affect any problem by coalitions of diverse groups, states amongst them. And we are forming these coalitions in multiple different places from Syria to the Rohingya. And one of the things that worries me about Labour's foreign policy is this reliance on the UN, for instance, as a place of states to deliver answers from everything to the exploitation of the environment to um, uh, unfair trade. The only other point I'll pick up on is the we point. It's so important. Um, when I was a diplomat and trained as a diplomat, this is a long time ago, but it still goes on. Um, when I was a young man, I used to think of myself as I. I think this, um, I decide that. When you do foreign office training, you are taught to think of yourself as we, um, and the singular pronoun becomes the plural over almost imperceptibly over time, so that by the time you're posted to somewhere like the UN, you start saying things like, we think sanctions are working on Iraq. Who is that we? Well, it is, of course, the notion inherited from Hobbes originally, but you know, reinforced over and over again, which I think is an outdated notion, that this small group of people can meaningfully represent the many. To me, the only answer to that is the participation of the many in legitimate forms. It's not just any non-state group, it's not terrorists, but a careful, diligent assessment of the legitimacy of voices who need to be part of the decisions about them. That applies as much in Hackney as it does at the UN. Um, thank you. Mary? Um, There's a lot to take in. There is an awful lot to take in. Select what you um, think will be kind of most right. important. So um, so Boris. Good. Um, two things about Boris. Um, first thing is that I think that he has been, he has got away with an enormous about, amount of irresponsibility, and he's been allowed to do that. Nobody, generally, has held him to account and made him answer um, for the things he says and does. And I think that that that, if you like, is the single thing that I think is about Boris now. I'm not, I'm not convinced that his career is yet over. Um, I would not exclude the possibility that he will one day be prime minister, um, even though it doesn't look particularly like it today. But I think there, there has to be a time when the buck stops with Boris Johnson. Um, and so far, 
even when he resigned as foreign secretary, he resigned on his own terms. He wasn't dismissed. Um, and I think, I think that is just totally wrong. Um, I also think when we're talking about diplomacy that the British diplomat um, who um, anticipated Boris reciting the Kipling poem um, deserves a medal with a million stars on it um, because that is exactly um, mm. what a diplomat and diplomatic training um, should be able to do. Um, and personally, I would not have been able to do that and it would have been the most um, appalling um, bilateral scandal if he'd, if he'd gone on. Can I push you on the kind of DFID, ODI, British Academy, the, mm -hmm. the network of foreign policy makers and how that <laughs> system creates or bad or good policy? Well, I, I mean, my, my view in a way is very small c conservative in that I think that um, somehow um, in the last 30 years, um, a sort of a fashion, uh, or a, 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 almost a, a, a preoccupation with fashion and an openness to being taken by the latest trend on sort of management thinking and things like that um, has has basically taken taken priority over absolutely um, sound knowledge of when I was talking about regions, you know, whether people know Russian or Arabic, whether they've actually been to those countries, whether they know how the people who, who live there think and work. Um, and it seems to me that that's been lost um, and it's been replaced by, um, as it were, almost the logical extension of this great glorification of generalists in the British civil service. Um, it's not unique to everybody. Um, I would say, look at, um, look at French diplomacy at the moment. And you can say what you like about Macron and losing popularity domestically. But to my mind, his, his practice of foreign policy has been absolutely spectacular. He has managed to keep on board Putin, Trump, the European Union, Angela Merkel, um, and he's done that in an apparently effortless way. And some of the reason for that is, the, to my mind, is the, expert, the depth of expertise in the Foreign Office and Macron's willingness to take advice from that expertise. I should say a little anecdote that when um, Putin was one of um, Macron's first guests, first guests, and he took him to Versailles to, um, to a historic, uh, historical exhibition, which was um, about Russia. It was a spectacular place to, to, to take Putin. It played to all Putin's um, character. And at some, somewhere during the press conference, Putin said to, in an almost throwaway remark, he said, um, I think you must have Russian speakers on your staff and people who understand Russian culture. Um, and Macron sort of nodded and pointed to people in his entourage. Um, I'm not sure that you would have the same experience um, in the unlikely event that Putin came to the UK. Um, going back to nation states, I actually think that I probably disagree with Khan here because I think that the, the power of the nation state um, is, is very compelling and that maybe over the last 20 years or since the end of the Cold War, there's been a sort of, um, there's been a fluidity in states because of the, things like the breakup of Yugoslavia, the breakup of the Soviet Union, things were in play which hadn't been in play before. But I think now, at least in Europe, Russia, they're starting to settle down. And what we're looking at is a resurgence of the nation state. And people have a very, they have very strong attachment to the place that they live. And whether, that, whether that's the nation state or whether it's their region, I think it's a force that you really shouldn't dismiss so easily. Thank you. Um, Sean, and then we'll finish with Bill and come out to the audience again. I want to go back to Boris, um, because Boris actually presents a bit of a paradox in the light of what we've just been saying, because um, irresponsibility, I don't know if it is his middle name, but it ought to be. But he is also a man of great knowledge, uh, of great, of you know, a lot of education. If you think back a few years to when he was campaigning uh, in favour of classics in schools, absolutely right. And, uh, and he showed a sort of of depth of um, a sort of hinterland, if you like, as an intellectual hinterland there, um, which was just very impressive. Um, and even in some of his most, um, most uh, sort of irresponsible moments, one thinks, for, for example, when he was talking about ping pong and, uh, and China and the Olympics um, a few years ago, strictly speaking, he's absolutely right. There was indeed a game called Whiff Whack, which was indeed played in the, di the dining halls of, of, of sort of English country houses. So in a sense, what you 
you have to bear in mind is that it's not so much whether or not you have knowledge. I would say it's the trivialization of knowledge. And that, it seems to me, is the theme which has gone through a lot of what we've just been hearing. The reorganization um, in, in the Foreign Office and elsewhere is effectively saying, well, your knowledge as, as it were, weighty knowledge, expertise, yes, I'll say it, sort of academic expertise, is a bit dull. Uh, what we're interested in, uh, not interested in, you know, old-fashioned, fussy old subjects, what we want are, are the themes. It's, a, it's a, a trend I've seen in, my, well, in one of my other hats in education uh, for a long time, the sort of move away from knowledge as such, and knowledge becoming a bit yeah. of, a, bit of a, a, a dirty word, even down to, you know, interesting information. That, it seems to me, is if you trivialise knowledge all the time, which, of course, is what, and you play to that, which is what Trump does, then you end up with uh, nothing else other than the personality. Bill. I don't want to spend too much time on Boris, but the, I think it's odd, isn't it, that in a panel that's going on about open democracy, we critique the person who speaks his mind, not very well particularly sometimes, in, in your opinion, maybe, but at least open about it, because I can assure you that what Boris says on the record is said every day off the record in Whitehall clubs and has been for 150 years, um, and it only occasionally slips out. So, you know, and more, most interestingly, in the recent period, because of the shock that the uh, inheritors of the new world order or the, the liberal rules-based world order have had from the recent wave of apparent support against them, because they're so surprised by that, they slip out with words like deplorables or that we're too ignorant to be given a vote. Um, whereas actually... Boris tells it as, it as he sees it. You might not like it, but I rather prefer it. Um, I'm not going to vote for him. The, what, what to do, I think, is the key question, I think, which some chap over there asked. And, and um, I mean, I read, was it Tom Tugendhat, who's the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, um, did a speech at the Royal United Services Institute a few months back where he said that the cornerstone of foreign policy is the nation state. And you have to go back to the people from whom you, you obtain your legitimacy and authority from. Now, I don't know, because obviously he's using a we then, you know, whether he's truly uh, interested in us. Um, he certainly voted Remain, so he doesn't seem to be that interested in the majority vote um, subsequently in relation to uh, leaving the European Union. But I do think knowing ourselves or know thyself, the old Greek uh, aphorism, is the essential starting point. Before, you know, I, I hear the point about we need to understand the world culturally and in other languages, but we also need to understand how much we've changed. I mean, actually, I spend more of my time looking at issues to do with terrorism than international grand strategy, and it always strikes me that we get very obsessed with them and their culture and their religion without noticing the extent to which many of the elements that we're complaining about are uh, right here in, in our domestic culture. If, it, if there's some foreign ideology that appeals to people in the UK to go off and do something, you have to ask, well, why is the ground so fertile here in the first place? But nobody wants to investigate that too much. It's much easier to project problems as coming from the outside. So I do think a concerted effort to understand what's changed over the last 20 years. Final point, I'm not a nationalist, but I do think it's important to have uh, accountable uh, people that we can hold to account on a scale that is human in some sense that you know they're you know, it can't, you know a global parliament doesn't strike me as you know oh, I can go and see my representative uh, and on a scale where people can take effective action uh, and I, am, I think it was picked up earlier but there is a difference in leadership between power and authority and I think what we are looking for is authoritative leaders uh, not just those abusing their power. And authority comes from inspiring and engaging people. That's what the nation states ought to be about. There was a question that we didn't answer, which was about uh, Trump's tweets and whether they were his um, and whether somebody else wrote them for him. Um, so far as I know and believe, um, I think they're absolutely his, and I don't think anybody writes them for him. Um, and you could say that that's part of the trouble with them. Um, but I... When he first came to office, people said, well, he'll have to give up tweeting. Um, and he didn't give up tweeting. He tweets in exactly the same spirit as he did before. Um, and I think, in some ways, the learning process has been 
ours rather than his in the sense that I think people have generally learnt um, how, how to regard them, um, either take them with a pinch of salt, dismiss them or argue with them, whatever. Um, and I actually think they've generally added to the, um, the, 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 the general um, entertainment and indeed texture of diplomacy. We, uh, we did an analysis of Trump's tweets and we found that there was indeed a pattern um, there's a kind of tri trifecta triptych pattern um, in a lot of them where he would state the problem. Um, US-Iran policy is, di is a disaster. Then he would critique it. He would say, Obama's policy has not, has not worked. Then he would offer a solution. We need to stand up to Iran. And you would see this tri triple pattern in an awful lot of the tweets. I don't think necessarily that means that somebody else wrote them. But interestingly, that triple pattern broke down once he entered government, that it's a lot easier to do that as a critique yeah. of government when you're criticizing those in power than actually when you're having to uh, represent the compromises. Uh, my question is about instantaneity, and it picks up something Mary said uh, about what happens when somebody now speaks. What seems to me has changed is that when uh, Trump tweets, when Boris utters, those things are immediately transmitted and potentially a transmitted right across the world to everybody, including to people who will receive them. The Japanese will receive uh, diplomatic utterances in a completely different way to the way a, a European perhaps would. Um, and it's not so long ago, certainly not within centuries, where diplomacy, you had to send somebody physically to a foreign power or a foreign tribe or whatever, and presumably that diplomat was in some way trained or at least informed in what they were doing. Uh, it does seem to me that we are now living in a different world in, in those terms. Um, because when Trump tweets, it does cross the entire world, and it also then invites immediate and instantaneous response. Um, and the tweets that, are, that respond to him in some ways potentially have equal authority to what he says. So I think that there really is a change in the situation we have. And my question is, uh, and my initial question was, you know, is that part of the problem? Is there a crisis in diplomacy because of this instantaneity? But listening to Khan, I think clearly you can see it also as an opportunity that it offers a way forward. And so my question is, you know, how far is it problem? How far opportunity? Hi, so I'm um, sorry if this has been asked before, but uh, my question is really about uh, the education that students receive in schools, especially about history. So from personal experience, I've found that whenever we learn about um, Britain's past and its own diplomatic past and how it's treated other nations, it's often quite far removed from the present. And often when we learn about history, it's quite sort of patriotic and that Britain's won the wars and Britain's won this. Mm. Um, and how important do you think it is for a, a nature of diplomacy that understands the cultures that British students receive like a holistic understanding of the impact of Britain on the past. It was previously mentioned that diplomacy mainly occurs behind closed doors and that diplomatic leaders don't often peacefully communicate with non-state organizations like terrorist or extremist groups. So with the changing diplomatic ch climate, do you think it's important to give these groups the ability to talk to state leaders in order to defuse conflict and hold them accountable outside of their own countries? I have a question about specifically RTV, sort of the Russian television channel, um, and what role that sort of holds with diplomacy and sort of the propaganda sent out by it and also sort of the pantomimish nature of international diplomacy now and sort of whether that is something we have to adapt to or whether that is sort of just a phase. We've learned from uh, an anonymous New York op-ed and the Bob Woodward book that there are people in the White House literally removing letters for the president to sign. So the, two, the question I want to know is, is that a democratic outrage or are we grateful that we have enlightened people and people working in the White House? Just regarding, um, say, like Trump's rhetoric on the international stage, certainly in his election campaign in 2016, he basically bullied the media and everyone to talk about what he wanted to talk about. He was always in the sort of news. He framed everything. Can he and does he do so on the international stage? Is his bombastic rhetoric actually working in, uh, in shifting 
attention to whatever goals Kim and, and the US state wants to achieve, um, and I'd like to get your sort of views on that. It's something that Mary mentioned about, um, sorry to return to Boris, um, <laughs> that Boris has gone too far and he needs to be held to account. Well, he is being held to account by those that elect him. Um, but who do you want to hold him to account? Uh, some sort of kind of manners police? or uh, kind of, So where, where, are, where are we? Do we, do we want a layer of manners police? Is that what we're really talking about here? Language, people saying the wrong thing at the wrong yeah. time? Or are we really talking about politics as a sphere of, of democratic, active, purposive uh, action? Also, add to that question, yes, ultimately, we hold Boris to account. But when you have the situation, as in Iran, where he makes a comment that puts a, a person already incarcerated at greater risk, arguably, then it's, that is beyond... At that point, are we beyond merely our domestic politics? Are we looking at a bigger picture here? What is the relationship between how we hold him to be accountable and a bigger accountability, which comes down to that question of, in that moment, leadership and perhaps listening to the diplomats who would have been briefing you on this. I thought that was unforgivable. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to now um, come back to our panel. Um, guys, this is going to be your kind of final opportunity to uh, answer the questions that have been put by the floor, respond to anything that you've heard from others in our panel, um, and give your... Uh, Kind of final take on the subject we've been discussing. Sean, if I can ask you to start. I'm going to address that question that came from the back about education, because that's a, sort of an area that, that I, I know a bit about. Um, I'm not, I can't say anything, obviously, about the education you've had, um, but I'd be surprised if, there's, if it had the sort of rather old-fashioned patriotic um, line. You may have done, but it would be unusual and has been for really quite some time. However, that, is, that would not be the case in American schools, where that very, very patriotic view of American history is very common. You only have to look at the textbooks and, and the whole sort of um, feel, if you like. And um, you, you said, should diplomacy, or, or should we understand other people's cultures? Absolutely. I could not agree with you more, and I would very much back Joel when he said, you know, that's part of your role as well. Um, because, obviously, I'm not saying every, to understand all is to forgive all, but you can avoid an awful lot of mistakes and blunders if you have some idea of the sensitivities of other cultures, and that cannot come from ignorance. Um, and, and that, of course, is, is uh, where I think the point about removing letters. There are two examples I can think of historically, um, one good, one bad. Uh, one caused a war, one avoided one. Um, and these were alterations of letters. One was done um, by Otto von Bismarck, when he quite deliberately altered a telegram in order to provoke a war, and, and he did. The other was by, bless him, Prince Albert, who altered a government um, um, telegram to the United States and avoided a war. Um, so this sort of thing is not new. It does go on. And as long as the motives of those doing it, uh, then, of course, we can be very thankful for them indeed. This all, of course, comes from a knowledge of history of the sort that you were talking about at the back. Thank you. Um, Bill. Um, there was a quick point. If I understood the question was, uh, why don't we talk to terrorists? And I think the answer, we always have. Uh, we did with the IRA. We talked to Islamists today. It's, it's not in the news. But it is occasionally. Um, there was a question in the middle about Trump bullying the media, to which my instinctive response was to go diddums, you know, because the media, are, you know, the media are big boys too, you know, and they're you know, more than capable of giving back. Um, but I guess you went on to develop your point, so maybe I misunderstood it, in terms of what effect is he having outside with this approach. I can tell you, I, so as a visiting professor to the National Party School in China, I think the Chinese are in shock. I think they really are taken aback by the level of sanctions, uh, now the spy accusations, and they are uh, you know, talking about how they need to alter their behavior because they understand that it's a, a serious problem for them. Um, so it's having some impact. Where that will go, I can't tell you. Um, then, well, there, we covered the removing letters, but I think it brings us onto a bigger point. I think it's worth reminding ourselves that 63 million people did not vote for Trump. They voted in the main against the existing Washington establishment. Um, some of them might have been committed Trump voters, but there is a significant difference to that. 
Um, to which the, it then begs the question, well, where's the Washington establishment now? You know, what have they done since Trump got elected, apart from complain and call him a fascist and, and say that he's bullying the media? Or, you know, it's, they, they've gone into meltdown, and that tells you much more about the state of uh, you know, US foreign diplomacy and understanding of the world than anything else. That their obsession, singular obsession with Trump tells you that they are unable to take a view on very important international matters. That's by far a bigger problem than Trump. Um, my very last point is that even the way we discuss this reveals that we perceive ourselves as spectators. We're wires on the bizarre world of international affairs. I asked my students last week, the first week back of term, is the United Kingdom currently at war? And you could see that they don't straight away know, and then there's a bit of discussion about wh whether we declare wars nowadays and what's called a war, or, you know, is action in support of an American mission a war. But, you know, I find it remarkable that young people don't know whether we're at war. It's a fairly fundamental thing that you would think is important to your life and to, you know, seeing yourself not just as the object being pushed around by external affairs, but as the future subject that determines what's happening in your life. And I think, to me, the biggest problem ahead lies in that disengagement. Mary. Oh, so many questions. Um, on the matter of whether it's um, sabotage or um, d democratic outrage for in, in the White House um, internal opposition, I tend to think it's democratic outrage. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons I say that is because I actually think the Washington establishment has been hugely successful um, in containing Trump, and in one respect in particular, in completely frustrating the Russia policy that he was, he, he was one of the things he was elected on. He has not been able to do that. And the reason he's not been able even to try to improve relations with Russia is because he's been stopped at every twist and turn, um, partly by Congress, partly by people on his own staff. And I, th I, th I think that's just um, is, is a, is a um, frustration of democracy and completely wrong. Um, on Boris and his language, I wasn't talking about, um, I wasn't sort of advocating any sort of um, language police. Um, it's more actions and it's more, I think, that if you're a foreign secretary or if you're a government minister, then you have to be held to, to, to a different standard from if you're, if you're an MP. Um, and it's not just Iran, but various, um, various other things where Boris w seemed to me to be hugely um, irresponsible. Um, the problem is that I also see the other side because I sort of know Boris a bit and he is a hugely gifted, hugely engaging character. Um, and in some ways, he ought to be, make a fantastic foreign secretary because he, he knows how to talk to people from a million backgrounds with a million first languages. He knows how to do that instinctively and he's very good at it. The problem is that there is the other side, um, which for some reason he's not been able to, um, to tame. Um, somebody asked specifically about RT, um, Russia Today. Um, I think it's very easy to demonize RT. Um, and I think that um, maybe from our side, from the UK side and the Western side generally, um, to use the collective we, um, maybe don't quite understand the extent to which Russia still post-Soviet Russia still doesn't understand how the Western world works and how it wants to, it wants to have equivalent institutions, in, in equivalent things that we've got. Um, and it sees RT as an external broadcaster um, that gives it the possibility of putting out a message. And that's the way it sees the BBC and BBC World Service as well. Um, so Lots of Russians, including at, at state level and at popular level, would see the BBC as a, if not a straight propaganda outfit, then as something that um, reflects the views and the perspective of the, the UK government. Now, we might say that's not true, and the BBC would say that's not true, but that's how it's perceived. Um, and that, in a way, is what Russia thinks it has, it, it's entitled to do. And that's what other 
state broadcasters do more or less. So I don't see it in terms of that conspiracy. Um, I think that um, if you look at it a little bit how Russia looks at it, then it's less to manipulate than to put a view across, which they think is a legitimate view. Um, right, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Mary. And finally, Tom. Uh, so many good questions. I mean, uh, I would say to Mary, it's not anti-democratic for Congress to stop Trump um, warming relations with Russia. Congress is elected, and if we're lucky, um, the House of Representatives will go to the Democrats next month, and Trump will be trammeled in a way that he, he we have not seen up until now, and hopefully, possibly impeached. Um, but I'll take three of the questions that came earliest. Um, the instantaneity question about the instantaneity, the instantaneousness of uh, social media does indeed cut both ways. Um, during a, an EU council meeting on sanctions against Syria, we learned during the meeting, hanging out in the, in the corridors outside, that Italy was opposing sanctions on aviation fuel being exported to Syria. Uh, we went to Twitter and singled out the Italians and using the Twitter handle of the Italian foreign minister said, why are you doing this? And we got a Twitter storm going directed at her and by the end of the meeting, Italy had folded, and we had sanctions on aviation fuel <laughs> against Syria, uh, which was a very positive thing. Um, so it does cut both ways. Uh, as for the effectiveness of Trump, um, he is in many ways highly effective, and it's a most unfortunate thing in some ways. In other ways, it's actually a good thing. Um, the negotiation of the, the relationship with Iran is now under question, and some European powers have talked about renegotiating the Iran deal as well as trying to circumvent American measures against it. Trump has forced the renegotiation of NAFTA in better terms uh, for the Americans uh, than for Canada. Uh, he is forcing a renegotiation of chi uh, re trade relations with China in terms that will probably benefit in the short run of disbenefiting both sides, uh, but in the long run will probably benefit US, the US more than China. This highly aggressive, we're gonna tear everything up um, approach does in certain circumstances, not by any means all of them, work. The abusiveness and the caricaturing that Trump does works because he's an American, because America runs the world financial system. Uh, the world financial system is denominated in dollars. The US is still the most powerful country in the world. This is why it doesn't work for Boris Johnson, because however ludicrous Trump is, we have to take him seriously because he's American. We have to attend very carefully to the substance of his tweets as well as to the cartoonish nature of them. The final point I'll take is the very important point about talking to terrorists, um, uh, where, again, we are missing the wood for the trees in these discussions because, of course, one of the global trends that's most disturbing is the uh, 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 proliferation of the war on terror, that ever since 9-11, um, extremist violence, Islamist extremism has spread to every continent except the Poles. Um, and it seems to be a permanent feature of our existence now that you get checked for security every building you go into in the United States that I don't see a plausible end to the war on terror, which is, having lived through 9-11 in New York City, is devastating to me that that is the case and the fact that we don't talk about how to stop it, how to end it. And of course we must talk to terrorists. By that, though, I think I'm criticizing the blanket uh, uh, condemnation of all terrorists, the exclusion of all terrorism from the political discussion, because of course terrorism is a catch-all phrase that has almost ceased to mean, mean anything. And we must learn to make distinctions between certain quote-unquote terrorist groups. There is no question that there cannot be a solution to Israel-Palestine without talking to Hamas, for instance, who have now routinely denounced as terrorists. Britain did not used to call Hamas terrorists until Israel uh, demanded that they call <coughs> Hamas terrorists. One may draw a, dis a red line, however, around the absolutist groups who demand only their world and no other, only their rules and no other, and of course by that I mean groups like ISIS, who in fact amongst terrorist groups, quote unquote, are a tiny minority. Most are seeking much more uh, negotiable local, political, regional demands. Thank <laughs> you.